Okay, just going to go through and review another common false doctrine from the new IFB cult. And one of their common straw man arguments, and I've, I've dealt with some of these replacement theology heretics, is they have to say that the New Testament and the New Covenant are the same thing. And he seems to miss, he quotes Hebrews chapter 8, which actually proves that God is not done with the nation of Israel. And he seems to leave up some parts of the verse that would contra contradict his system and that prove that it is for the Jews. Because they try to say, oh, it's for Christians. And when you bring up the Old Testament prophecies, like in uh, Ezekiel 36 and that kind of stuff, which prove that God is not done with the nation of Israel, they say, well, that's for Christians and that kind of stuff. And ridiculous. But I'm going to show you how he totally twists Hebrews chapter 8. And just mixes because again they think that new testament and new covenant are the same thing which they're not okay and, and he goes on to say that people in the old testament were saved by the faith of jesus christ even though he hadn't even died on the cross yet uh you know which is kind of weird because what was the point of animal sacrifices you know whole other issue but he totally turns hebrews 8 on his head and seems to miss some parts of the verse that make a problem for his replacement theology heresy so let's get right into this Hey everybody, Brother Ben here. I want to talk in this video real quickly about this false doctrine that Zionists teach by ripping... Zionists. Yeah, gotta love that. Zionists. Uh, no, we're just Bible-believing Christians. We're not Zionists. Ridiculous. Scriptures out of context from Hebrews chapter 8, Romans 11, and elsewhere. Basically what they believe is one day all the Jews are magically going to get converted in the end times. But what they don't understand is... That's impossible, it's stupid, it's preposterous, it's a ridiculous, false doctrine, totally asinine to teach one day the Jews get a special, miracle, Calvinistic salvation event, especially for them. Um, that's what the Bible teaches. Okay? The Jews, because of course they're post-tribbers, which, you know, replacement theology and post-trib go hand in hand. But what the Bible teaches, I'm going to show you Romans chapter 11, which... You know, again, if you're replacing theology, how do you answer this? Romans chapter 11, verses 1 to 2. I say then, hath God cast away his people? Okay, here's the question. Did God cast away the peop his people? Look at what he says. God forbid. And you say, well, it's talking about Christians. Keep reading. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul's saying he has not cast away the Israelites. That's what he's saying. Verse 2, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Will ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, and it goes down there. God has not cast away his people. And, you know, you go down to verse 25, and I'm going to show you the problem. If you think this is talking about Christians, I'm going to show you the problem. Uh, Romans 11, verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles could be come in. If this is talking about Gentile Christians, why is it saying the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, and then blindness has happened to the Gentiles? Because what their replacement theology her uh, heretical logic is, is basically making this verse say, is that the Gentiles are Israel, so, in other words, blindness has come to, to the Gentiles until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Huh? Because that, that's, and they say, well, we don't believe that. That's what, that's where it leads to. Because it's saying blindness in part has it happened to Israel. You know? There's a future plan for them. Look at verse 26. For so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and he shall turn, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Um, this is not talking about the New Testament. The covenant is what God does with the Jews. It's not talking about New Testament. New Testament and New Covenant are not the same thing. Look at verse 28. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. And it goes down there. And it goes on to say that Gentiles, we, the gospel went to us because they went to the Jews first, you know, went to the Jew first, then to the Greek. And then once they rejected it, salvation has come unto the Gentiles now, through their rejection. But God still got plans for the nation of Israel. Again, you know, this is my covenant with them. It's not talking about the New Testament. And again, how do you deal with the, with the first two verses of Romans 11? How the God cast away his people? God forbid. He's not casting away his people. He had to do some serious scripture twisting in order to teach that. But I'm, I'm going to get into Hebrews 8 later on, because Romans 11 ties in with Hebrews 8. And I'm going to show you how he's turning it on its head. Let's continue. 
God's not a respecter of persons, and you find that nowhere in the book of Revelation. You find that nowhere in any scriptures dealing with end times Bible prophecy. It's just a fabrication that they are pushing to try and deceive people into believing that the Jews have some sort of special standing with God, despite the fact that they've rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah and hate the gospel. Um, okay, again, what does Romans 11 say? I mean... I agree, they do hate the gospel. It is true, the Jews today are very wicked. They are very wicked, you know, they're in all kinds of sin and wickedness. But, and yes, they do in fact hate the gospel, because that's what the Bible says, okay? Again, Romans eleven twenty eight. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Concerning the gospel, they're your enemies, but they're still beloved for the Father's sake. They're still God's people. God has future plans for them. So yes, they are enemies of the gospel, but that does not mean God is done with them. It's heresy. And when I was part of this new IFB, I was in this new IFB called for like I was like two years, and you know I believe all that the scripture twisting. Uh, but once you actually read the Bible for yourself, it's uh, you'll, you'll be amazed how much these new IFB cultists twist scripture. Well, the Bible. This is where they get it from Hebrews chapter eight, where it says. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. And it goes on and says... For th- okay, when it says, I regarded them not, he's not saying, okay, they're no longer my people. It's talking about the Old Testament, basically. The Jews, they fell out of the covenant... But that's why there's a new covenant that comes in place. Again, we're going to get into the scriptures and show how he's leaving out some key parts of this verse, this this passage of Hebrews 8. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my laws, saith the Lord, of course, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Now, what's this talking about? Is it a future covenant God makes in the end times in which he magically, Calvinistically, saves all the Jews alive at that time. No, that's dumb. Um, yes, it is, actually, because let's, let's read Hebrews 8 again and show you how he's leaving out some key words. Okay, Hebrews chapter 8, I will start at verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by now how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises, how that for that if the first covenant had been faultless, there should be sorry, there should no place have been sought for the second. What's going on there? They fell out of the first covenant, so that's why there's a second one coming. They they messed up the first one, they got in sin and wickedness, you know, so there's a second covenant. But we're going to see who this is really addressed to and how it's not addressed to Bible-believing Christians. Uh, Hebrews 8, verse 8. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the day the day is come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I have a quick little question. So, um, and I know Sam Gitt brought this up in one of his sermons, but is Anderson, you know, they call, are they from the house of Israel or the house of Judah? I am curious about that, quite frankly. Are they from Israel or Judah? I'd like to hear an answer on that. But look at verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. Um, if this is addressed to Christians, when were Gentile Christians, when were our fathers led out of Egypt by God? He's talking about the Jews. It's a covenant for the Jews. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Again, when did God make a covenant with Gentile believers? I'm, a, I'm from Russia. I'm a white European. Uh, my ancestors were pagans. They were Slavic pagans. They were not. Look, they were not in any kind of covenant. They were not led out of Egypt by God. Verse ten. For this is the covenant that I will make both with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And then it goes down. You know, and it lines up perfectly with Ezekiel thirty-six. I'm going to cover that too. I believe it's Ezekiel thirty-six covers the same thing. It's prophecy about how God is not done with the nation of Israel. Uh, where is it? I think it's, I can't remember the verse. Uh, yeah. I think I'll just start at verse 22. And again, keep in mind how Ben the Baptist says, oh, they hate God, they're blaspheming God. Well, let's see what the Word of God says, because the Word of God says they blaspheme God, but God still makes a covenant with them. 
going to show you that. Ezekiel 36, 22. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen whither ye went. They're blaspheming God, they're profaning his name, but God still has a covenant for them. Just because they're they're blaspheming God, which they are, and, and all kinds of wicked blasphemy goes over, over in Israel against the Lord Jesus Christ, but it doesn't nullify the promises God made to Israel. Uh, verse 23, And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, again, profaning the name of God, he's not done with them, which ye have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I would, for I, look at this, and here's another thing, if this is addressed to Christians, because some of them try to say, well, you know, this this is, I, I got into an argument with one of these Anderson goons, and I quoted him a bunch of verses about prophecies of the future restoration of Israel, and he said, well, that, that's for Christians, that's for Gentile Christians, or, you know, whatever. Um, here's how you answer them on that, because if this is addressed to Gentile Christians, here's a problem. Ezekiel 36, 24, For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and bring... And will bring you into your into your own land. Not good at reading on a screen, but look at this: gather you out of all countries. Uh, when were Gentile Christians dispersed into all countries by God? Um, we weren't. It's talking about the Jews. Uh, verse twenty-five. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Will I cleanse you? Kind of like the wailing wall, graven image. He's cleansing them from their idols. Verse 26, a new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put with I will sorry, will I put within you, and I will take away your stony heart out of your flesh, or take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And then it goes down there. But look at verse 28. Lines up perfectly with Hebrews chapter 8. He, Ezekiel 36, 28. And you shall dwell in the land which I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I shall be your God. Or I will be your God, sorry, not shall. So talking about the future restoration of Israel. God is not done with them. Yes, they are blaspheming his name. Yes, they are profaning his name among the heathen. Absolutely. That's the whole point of the time of Jacob's trouble. God has chastened the Jews. Hence why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is Israel. You know, And, and, and before you say, well, you know, uh, Jacob's trouble is not talking about the tribulation. I'm going to quickly answer that because just so they can't say, oh, you didn't answer that. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so there is none like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And they'll say, see, you know, it's it's not the same thing as the tribulation. You know, okay, let's read it. Uh, Alas, that day is great, for so that none is like it. There's none like it. Lines up perfectly with Matthew chapter 24, which is, in fact, about the quote-unquote tribulation. Matthew chapter 24... Where is it? There it is. 24 verse. Sorry, not verse 20. Matthew chapter 24. Uh, which verse? I can't remember, can't remember the exact verse off the top of my head. I can't. It's a, uh, yeah, verse 21. Sorry, not verse 20. Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. Notice how uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 7 says, you know, there's none like it, that kind of stuff. Look at verse 20, or Matthew 24, 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, into this time, no nor ever shall be. Lines up perfectly. So yes, the time of Jacob's trouble is the, the quote-unquote great tribulation. It's for the Jews. That's the whole point of this time period. They are profaning the name of God among the heathen. That's the point of the time of Jacob's trouble to chasten them. Again, I believe it's uh, Daniel... More proof that this time period is, in fact, for the Jews, not for Christians. Daniel, I think it's 9, verse 24. And these are not in my notes. These are just a little side thing. Daniel, Daniel 9, 24. More proof that this is for the Jews. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish tra the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring an everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Thy people and thy holy city. Uh, what's thy people? Israel. What is thy holy city? Jerusalem. God is not done with the nation of Israel. Don't believe these new IFB cultists who say, oh, it's not talking about the Jews, it's not talking about the Jews. Ridiculous. Well, let's continue. He, he goes on to say, oh, you know, covenant, you know, he, he tries to say that covenant and testament are the same thing. Uh, utter heresy. 
this is the new covenant that Jesus Christ established at Calvary. The death, burial, and resurrection, that was enough to save. Okay, so here's here's the problem. If what is in Hebrews 8 is the new covenant, let me show you, or is the New Testament, if, if it's the same thing as the New Testament, then that would mean that the New Testament is only for the Jews. Again, I'll show you why. Because he's saying, keep in mind, he's saying that this is talking about the New Testament. Okay, let me read it to you again. Because if that was true, that would mean that it's only for the Jews. Which obviously it's not, but if it was that if that was the case, I'll show you why. Not according to Hebrews 8 9, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them out of the out sorry, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the, of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regard them not, saith the Lord. So again, who has been taken out of the land of Egypt? It's the Jews. So if this is talking about the New Testament, um, then that would mean that the New Testament is only for the Jews. Which obviously is not. Anyone can get saved, regardless of whether they're Jew or Gentile. But you see that you see the mess you get yourself into by saying this is talking about the New Testament. Ridiculous. And you know you, you can watch the whole thing. He just goes on. He goes on to say that you know people in the Old Testament were saved by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, which is kind of funny because again, what was the point of animal sacrifices? What was the point of you know going to the temple and that kind of stuff? What was the point of doing all these different things? Uh, if, if you're saved with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, there were prophecies about it in the Old Testament. There were types about it, but they weren't putting that in, in you know, as faith in, in, you know, faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. And again, I'm, I'm leaving no stone unturned. I'm going to show you the scripture they tried to use to prove that. Acts 10, I think it's verse 43. Again, leaving no stone unturned. Acts ten forty three, uh, to him gave all the pro give all the prophets witness that, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive receive remission of sins. And they're saying, see, all the prophets were basically preaching the death, burial, resurrection for salvation. That's not at all what it's talking about. It's all the prophets witness. It's talking about the prophecies of Jesus Christ back in the Old Testament. The prophet the prophets prophesying the coming Messiah, you know, the coming Savior Jesus Christ. It's not talking, not saying he died and rose again the third day. It's, you know, ridiculous. But they love to twist that verse too. To say that people in the Old Testament, so basically what they're saying is that Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were basically putting their faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, this is the heresy you get yourself into when you're a replacement theology, non-dispensational, uh, post-trib, all this, this uh, heresy, this satanic heresy. So don't be deceived by this new IB cult. Uh, they're just, they're so messed up. So anyway, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the brethren. Goodbye.